Well, I think that clock's a little slow. If mine say it's one o'clock, so we're going to jump in and try to keep okay. things going for a long time here. Uh, yeah, the topic is which way America. And I showed this slide in chapel, uh, but I'll show it again. And part of what I want to do is uh, I get into a lot of, uh, let's say, discussions on Facebook occasionally debates, uh, and I keep wanting to say it's just not that simple because we're drawn to these, not just simple, but simplistic answers. And um, especially people who are given post-secondary education, it should mean that people die, the more critical thinking. So I want to take a look at a couple different issues confronting the U.S. today, and these are the, the main ones. I mentioned this in, in the chapel address. Are we going to continue to be a democracy or not? And I think that's a fair question. Again, whether you're left or right, people are nervous about democracy, whether it's voter suppression on the one hand or voter fraud on the other and all the back and forth. But I think it's an important question. Second is capitalism versus socialism. And I'm going to argue that it's kind of a silly question because there aren't that many really socialist countries in any complete free market enterprise systems in the world. It's something somewhere in between. And then I'll talk a little about issues as we have time related to criminal justice, mass incarceration, guns and violence. And then if we have time, we'll jump into even the controversial issue of abortion. This is the same slide I had in the chapel address, but the Economist Intelligence Union for the last six years has classified the US as a flawed democracy. And these are the metrics they use. A system of elections used to choose and replace the government, protection of human rights of all people, active participation of citizens in politics and civics, and all lies apply equally. And then uh, International IDA basically looks at democracy around the globe, and they use 28 indicators. They come under some of the same things. Representative government, fundamental rights, checks on government, impartial administration, what a novel idea in the first administration, because we're so locked into partisanship. Uh, anyhow, participatory engagement. And they classified us as a backsliding democracy uh, more recently. And so it's a fair question. And part of that, I think, has been brought on by our uh, weariness because of COVID. And I keep people keep saying we're limiting our freedoms. And I keep pointing people back to the preamble to the Constitution, which says we were, we're going to form a more perfect union to establish justice. I sometimes think of these things on the left as a report card. Uh, what kind of grade would you give the U.S. to establish justice? How about ensuring domestic tranquility? I don't think we're doing real good on that one. Uh, provide for the common defense. Our defense spending is more than the next nine countries combined, so at least Measuring it by spending, we're doing pretty good. How about this one, promote the general welfare? And part of the problem is, securing the blessings of liberty and promoting the general welfare don't always work together. We have speaking signs, we have seat belt laws. These are things that constrain our liberties, but promote the general welfare. But you get, during the era of COVID, a lot of people screaming about liberty and don't tread on me and all things like that. It's a balancing act. I'm not saying I know the answer to the proper balance, but it's something we have to keep in mind. It's not just about liberty. It's about the common good and promoting the general welfare. That's what the founders had in mind, and that's what I want to point back to. Let me say up front here, anywhere along that you have questions or comments, shout them out, raise your hand, whatever, because I'm hoping this will be a dialogue. Uh, capitalism versus socialism. Um, again, uh, this is so many of the issues get presented as a binary. It's A or B, and it's most often C or A plus B or something like that. And I think it's true here. If you look at it, most economies of the world are mixed economies. Have things that we consider public goods uh, available to all, and other things that are done by private enterprise. Uh, Terry Darling and I first group to Cuba. And even in Cuba, which many would point to as one of the remaining socialist countries, they had been moving in the direction of more private enterprise and allowing people entrepreneurship and things like that, even in Cuba. Uh, let me see if the, I think the sound system's on, we'll check. I'm gonna show a video that's somewhat humorous that gets at some of the issues here. 
And apparently the sound is not on. Let's see if we can fix that. I hear boss, I think so maybe that tells us something here. That will probably be last. Denmark, like Venezuela, has stripped people of their opportunities. Okay, let's just clarify a few things. Trish, you're wrong. You can't compare Denmark to Venezuela. We have a welfare state in our country. This means that our society provides opportunity for people. It doesn't strip people of possibilities in their life. And no one wants to work. This is a real problem. This is not true. According to the OECD, Denmark rates 11 places higher than the U.S. unemployment rate. The difference, of course, being that in Denmark, people are paid a decent wage. School's free. University's free. That's lovely. Actually, it is. But you see, not only is school free, they actually pay you. Not bad, eh? That is not bad. That means that it's not the size of your parents' bank account that decides whether or not you get an education. It's your hard work, it's your talent, it's your motivation. Well, you know what happens then? Nobody graduates from school, they just stay in school. Of course people graduate. According to a World Economic Forum, on a list of the best educated populations, we rank number six. Quite a bit better than the U.S. Sorry. Nowadays, all the kids graduating from school in Denmark, they want to start cupcake cafes. <laughs> I wish that was correct, because I love cupcakes. Unfortunately, it's not. It could be, though, because according to Forbes list, over countries with best opportunities for businesses, Denmark rates far better than the U.S. So Trish, pretty much everything you said is untrue, or as your beloved president would put it, you are fake news. All right, any quick comments or questions on any of that? I mean, it's somewhat humorous, but obviously Denmark and Venezuela are pretty different countries uh, in a lot of ways. And the issue, this is Harry Truman saying, socialism is a scare word they've hurled at every advance the people have made in the last 20 years. Socialism is what they call public power, it's what they call social security, it's what they call farm price support, it's what they call bank deposit insurance, it's what they call the growth of free and independent labor organizations. Socialism is their name for almost anything that helps all the people. That's Truman's response. And this is after Roosevelt's New Deal, before Johnson's Great Society, and during the Great Society initiatives, that's when we get Medicare and Medicaid and some other things. There are other examples of some of this. And so most of the systems of the world are mixed. And what determines the difference between them is which things are best done by the private sector. There was a time, if you don't know, when fire um, departments were private. You had to buy a subscription. And you put a little tag on your house that told you you had paid. And when the firemen came, if you had the tag, they put out the fire. If you didn't have the tag, they watched your house burn into the ground. I kind of like having fire departments that don't do it that way. Uh, I think that's probably a good thing. Libraries, other things like that, Pell Grants, federally subsidized student loans are things that some would call socialism. The real question is which things should be public goods available to all. And that's where the countries differ. They mentioned Denmark, no charge for tuition. Does that sound like something? Yeah. And they pay $750 a month to help you with living expenses while you're in university. Sounds pretty good by comparison, right? And so we're gonna take a look at some things and how some things have produced changes. This is something I'm particularly sensitive to since I'm a senior citizen now, and I'm drawing Social Security. Uh, the poverty line for the elderly in 1967, 30% of the poor were living below poverty. 30% of the senior citizens were living below poverty. That's right about the time that Social Security has had 30 years of existence, 39, the Fair Labor Standards Act is when Social Security comes in. <coughs> we have two things happening. One, Social Security is full swing at this point, and Medicare. I'm also on Medicare now, that's my health insurance. And so the one line that's going up is Social Security expenditures per capita. The line that's going down is seniors living in 
poverty, senior citizens living in poverty. It's now 7% instead of 30%. And that's a pretty good reduction in a pretty short period of time. And so that's one that I would point to and say, this is maybe a place where this so-called socialism, which is really just public goods, did some good in terms of reducing poverty. Uh, I'm going to take a look at a more um, complicated metric in a second. This is just, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's something called the Legatum Prosper Prosperity Index that basically classifies the countries of the world on 12 different dimensions and then ranks them according to how they do on these dimensions, including an overall score. And it says up here, 12 pillars of prosperity split into 67 discrete policy-focused elements grouped into three domains, essential to prosperity, inclusive societies, open economies, and empowered people. They use 300 different indicators from over 70 different data sources to construct the index. So it's a pretty sophisticated one. And you can go to legatum.com and you can look at the methodology and see how they're measuring this stuff. Well, this is what you get, and I uh, changed this a little bit. Um, Notice that the top four there, can you all read that? I'm um, just, okay. Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland. And the overall rankings, these are the countries that score the highest combined rank. And then across the top, they have the 12 indicators. I had to do all the, they just had the symbols before, and I had to put in the words. It took me a little while. Safety, freedom, governance, social capital, investment environment, enterprise conditions, infrastructure and market conditions economic quality, living conditions, health, education, and natural environment. Well, so we can compare, right? the U.S. ranks 20th overall, but I cut and pasted the U.S. and moved it up a bit so that we could compare it to these other four countries. Uh, Norway, for example, comes number one in safety. The U.S., under the safety and security thing, number 69, which puts us in the company of third world countries in terms of safety and security. If you think about it, the mass shootings, uh, I, I lived in Guatemala for nine years where they have a higher homicide rate, but I never once worried about being in a movie theater and someone coming in and just opening fire on a movie theater or going to a school. The mass shootings that we have are pretty unique to American society and we can talk about maybe why that is. So that's the safety dimension. The other place where we don't do as well, over here under the category of health, third from the right, we come in number 68 overall. And mostly it's because almost all these other countries have universal health care. And we're an outlier in terms of health care. So those are the two areas where we do worst. Uh, the two areas where we do best, where we come in fourth, are enterprise conditions and infrastructure and market conditions. But in some of the others, we're in the 20s um, or the teens in terms of where we rank compared to other nations of the world. Let me stop there and see if, what kinds of questions that provokes. Yeah? I, I personally struggle with believing that we're right number four in the structure. Okay, yeah. I don't believe it. You want to hit a pothole in the way to spring or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, and certainly, when you see the bridges collapsing and other things, well, what they mean, particularly by infrastructure here, is the economic infrastructure. So Wall Street and things like that. But yeah, I, I agree. We, and fortunately, the Congress just finally got together and in a slightly bipartisan way passed an infrastructure bill that hopefully is going to bring broadband cable to more communities and fix the roads and ports and and maybe even get train, if you've been in Europe and used the train system in Europe at all, ours, Amtrak, I was looking at trying to take Amtrak to Nashville once. And the first stop was Atlanta, the second stop was DC, and 22 hours later, you would arrive in Nashville. You can drive there in eight hours. And so it's, and, but if you're in England and you take their train system, you did incredibly efficient. So it would be nice. That would be one dream for me as an infrastructure. They keep talking about a bullet train between Detroit and Jackson or Chicago, which I would hop on regularly because I love Chicago. That's where I grew up. What are the questions? About any of the rankings here? Yeah. So education, does that kind of combine public and private and then also like K through twelve and then like college yes. and higher ed? Yeah, and they're looking at uh, percentage of people that go on to higher ed, accessibility, 
again, a variety of metrics overall. Where do we rank on the education factor there? 20th. 20th. So it matches where we are overall. And you see the four Nordic countries, Denmark, Norway, Norway, Sweden, Finland, 3, 10, 4, and 14. So some of the pretty good educational systems comparatively. Other questions on this? Yeah. I mean, I think it's looking at the other countries compared to their freedom ranking. Yeah. Depending on how you view our government. Yes. Yeah, because they're ranking one, two, three, and four, yeah. and we come in 22, and, and which is ironic given all of our stuff about liberty and things like that. But they come in pretty high on personal freedom. And, uh, you know. and, and my point is simply, Denmark, just so you know, is a capitalist country, but they have a different definition of public goods. Uh, and so they're saying, let's make education, they look at education as an investment in the future. We tend to look at his students as profit centers or something like that. I'm not speaking about Spring Harbor, but just generally. Uh, and the same with healthcare. Um, now, they pay higher taxes in Denmark. I, back when I was full time, I did the math, and I would pay $10,000 a year more in taxes than I would pay in the U.S. But it doesn't change when you get older. That's right? the thing. And, would you? well, the, the big thing is, the university, when I was full-time, was paying $13,000 a year for health insurance. Now, when I say the university is paying, what I'm really saying is, thanks, guys, because uh, you're the ones that are paying for my health insurance. Uh, and I was paying $1,800 a year for health insurance, and then you add the co-pays and all the rest on top of it. Well, if I make $10,000 less, but I get free health care or health care covered by taxes, I'm ahead, even at a 51% tax rate. And so the point I make in that is you can't just look at what you pay. You have to look at what you get for what you pay. And if you get access to education and access to health care, and uh, we'll see. Uh, vacation is quite different in European countries. It's not uncommon to get 12 weeks of vacation in countries in, in Europe. And here, you're two if you're lucky uh, in a lot of places. Any other questions on this before I move on? And I, I, to make my point about Denmark being a capitalist country, the former CEO of Legos, you guys know Legos, right? Lives in Denmark, he's Danish. He has $5 billion. That's pretty capitalist. I mean, $5 billion, that's higher than I can count, uh, greatly, and that's a lot of money. And so they have very wealthy people and all that stuff, but they have a different definition of what should be considered public good. And they have lots of things that are capitalist and private organizations. IKEA is a Swedish company, for example, uh, but different definitions. Even if you look at best countries for business, he mentioned that briefly. Uh, this is from Forbes magazine, which is very much a pro-capitalist uh, magazine. Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Norway come in 2, 7, 13, and 15. The US comes in number 17. So even if you're looking at climate for business, they come out looking pretty good by comparison. Few maps. The map, the countries in green here are the countries where there's no charge of tuition for post-secondary education. Now, in a country like Guatemala, it is free. You can go to university free, but the books and the uniforms and other stuff, and so um, their percentage of population that has a baccalaureate degree, a bachelor's degree, is about one percent compared to 27, 28 percent in the U.S. So even though it's free. It's not accessible for many people just because of the poverty in Guatemala. But all the countries in green have tuition-free education, and there may be fees of various kinds. Paid leave for new mothers. The countries in brown are the countries that don't have paid leave for new mothers. And they identify six, and it's you know, the ones I remember were Liberia, Swaziland, Papua New Guinea, and the U.S. We had a friend here for a focus series years ago, a friend of mine from the Czech Republic, he's kind of a leading economist, and I was telling him about this, and he said, that can't be right, you have to be wrong, that you don't have federally mandated maternity leave. He said, no, it's really up to the individual companies whether or not you get maternity leave. 
uh, in uh, many countries, like they give here, the ones in darker colors, it's 24 weeks or more paid maternity leave, which is pretty generous compared to what most corporations would give you in the U.S. This one seems like a slam dunk to me. This ought to be, we ought to have paid leave. And I'll talk in a minute about, uh, well, I'll tell you now, and we'll talk about why it's important. In the Czech Republic, they have tuition-free education, they have universal health care, you get 14 weeks of paid maternity leave starting four weeks before your new due date, followed by up to three years of paid parental leave. Three years. Three years, Czech Republic. Three years paid parental leave. And Tomas said logic was the Czech economist I was talking to. His wife had just had a baby, and so they were going to alternate years. So one year she was going to be off, the next year he was going to be off, but one of the two parents gets three years with their newborn. We have nothing close to that uh, overall. But they've decided that that's a public good. Having parents with their children when they're young is a positive thing. Uh, this is the healthcare one. Uh, the ones in green are countries with universal but not free health care. Uh, the ones uh, in blue are countries, sorry, countries with universal but not free health care, countries with free but not universal health care in blue, and the brown are the ones without universal health care. Uh, and so again, now in Guatemala, again, they have universal health care. It's pretty bad, but it's universal. Everybody has access. We have kind of a two-tiered system. My grandson was born in Guatemala, private hospital, um, two OBGYNs, anesthesiologists, and surgeon in a private room. Total cost $1,500. Um, if you don't know, it could be closer to $15,000 or more here in the U.S. So if you can afford the private system, pretty good there. Um, when we look at the cost of health care, Years ago, the New York Times had an article that said, the U.S. healthcare system, the best system in the world, are just the most expensive. And their conclusion was, just the most expensive. We spend, if you read it, 16.8%, so around 17% of GDP on healthcare. These other countries, all of which have universal healthcare, average about 10.5% of GDP on healthcare. So even though we don't cover everybody, our healthcare system is expensive. Now, I'll give you one example that I came across. I'm type 2 diabetic, and I take a medicine for my diabetes that's not cheap. Um, if I were paying the list price without health insurance, it'd be $1,500 a month. With my health insurance, or good RX, or single care, $535 a month. When I, go, I buy mine in Guatemala, I can get the exact same product with the exact same manufacturer for $95. I don't think they're selling it at a loss in Guatemala. Now, they're not selling it at a loss in Guatemala, it means they're making a whole lot of money on their drug here in the U.S. So pharmaceuticals are one of the things we're really pushing the high health care costs. Health insurance is another thing, pushing high health care costs uh, in the U.S. Um, this is just showing, again, kind of comparative perspective. This is showing these countries kind of lined up the horizontal axis is GDP per capita, the vertical axis is health spending per capita. And if you know statistics, they're doing a regression line there. For the most part, you have a pretty straight line, but again, the U.S. is pretty much an outlier overall with really high expenditures on health care. Okay, before I move on to a different topic here, let me see what kinds of questions, comments on any of that. Part of my doctoral program, one of my minors was medical sociology, and where we looked at a lot of comparative healthcare systems and things like that. And that's when I began to say, hmm, maybe we could learn something from another country about how we could improve things overall. Um, and I, I see that on a lot of different fronts. Depending on how I really just like, what, why, where do you end up like, what kind of, like, what's the, what's the problem here? What, Money, but in what way are we so afraid of our 
what's the money motivation? Can you explain the money motivation? Yeah, I, I looked at United Health Group's the largest health insurance company in the U.S. And I, if you go to sec.gov, which is Securities Exchange Commission, there's a thing called the DEF 14A, where you can find out salaries of top executives and so forth. For over a two-year period, the top six executives at United Health Group made $51 million. And then I looked at the top, uh, look at the Fortune 500 list of the top pharmaceutical companies, and the top 10 pharmaceutical companies had 61 billion in profits. And if it's a publicly traded company, their first obligation by law is to stockholders. And so that's part of the difficulty I have. I, I think there are places where private enterprise is not best. Pro private for profit prisons strikes me as a really bizarre idea. Um, and that's actually part of the next topic. But yeah, that's where it comes from. And the lobby groups fund our politicians' campaigns. I mean, huge amounts of money. Left, right, Democrat, Republican, everybody's getting money from the healthcare industry. I would like to see how many people on that list that are billionaires who were once working in the public sector. Yeah. Because I guarantee over 75% of them are. That's very possible. Yep, yep, a lot of them. Well, Joe Manchin's one of the Democrats has been kind of opposed to some of the bills to move forward. His daughter was CEO of the company that raised the price of Happy Pants by 600%, and she got an increase by 400%. And so maybe some conflict of interest there. It's a possibility at least. Uh, and, and that's a problem across the board. I mean, with a lot of the issues we're covering, there's just so much money in politics that it's difficult to really have to be of the people, by the people, and for the people. This is one I'm very sensitive to because I was working in the prison right around here, and at that time there were about 400,000 people incarcerated in the U.S. Today it's 2.6 million. There's no country in the world that comes close to us, either in raw numbers or in rate, just the population kind. And so mass incarceration is one of the issues that um, it's one area where there's begun to be conversations across the aisle between Democrats and Republicans saying, maybe it's time for criminal justice reform. And I hope that conversation continues because it's really long overdue. The big increase came with the war on drugs. Um, I, at one point, for example, Michigan used to have a 650 lifer law. If you're caught, 650 grams of cocaine, it's an automatic life sentence. I actually held 650 grams of cocaine once. I didn't use it. Uh, I had a probation officer who was teaching at Hillsdale College. A probation officer came in, he brought it from the evidence room. It's about the size of a bag of powdered sugar. And their idea was, if we make these laws really tough, we'll get the drug kingpins. But what they got is mid-level pushers off the streets, serving life sentences. Not one of those, when I taught in the women's prison, one of my students was one of those people. She looked like this cute gray-haired lady that would make oatmeal cookies for you, but she was selling cocaine instead. Uh, but she's doing a life sentence because of that. Eventually, Michigan repealed that because they realized it's not doing what they thought it would do. It's not getting the drug kingpins. It's just clogging up the prisons. Uh, and we're, we're still kind of stuck there. Any questions on that before I move on to something? The rise in the prison population since the mid-70s then, when yeah. the, the rise in that population, is that mostly violent or non-violent offenders? Mostly non-violent. I, I actually asked a warden once, I said, you know, of all the guys who are incarcerated here, what percentage really need to be incarcerated for the safety of society? And he said about 25%. And, and actually things like parole or electronic tether or other ways are much cheaper than incarceration. It costs about $35,000 a year to incarcerate somebody. And so I hope to move to mass incarceration. Here comes one of the problems. More and more states have gone to private, for-profit prisons. You can buy stock in a prison company. And if the more people go to prison, the richer you will get. Yeah, okay, I see several people. What? Uh, yeah, it's bizarre. Uh, and I, I hope 
Well, there have been several people proposing bills. I think California did do away with private for profit prisons. Uh, there's a lot of money in incarcerating people. And again, the conflict of interest there is because when you're in prison, when I worked in the prison, somebody could get a ticket for not making their bed or not being where they're supposed to be. If you get enough tickets, they can prolong your sentence. Well, if you're a private for profit prison, you have a vested interest in filling every bed and prolonging those sentences and in the process converting justice. Uh, and so it's an area I think we need to revisit. Um, you saw that when it comes to safety and violence, the U.S. didn't do particularly well on the Gain and Prosperity Index. So the homicide rate in the U.S. was seven and a half times higher than the homicide rate in other high-income countries combined, which was largely attributed to a firearm homicide rate that was 24.9 times higher. The overall firearm death rate was 11.4 times higher in the U.S. than in other high-income countries. And this is where I get into debates on Facebook because people want to be able to say it's either all about the guns or it's not at all about the guns. And it's partly about the guns and it's partly about other stuff. There was one year, uh, Charles Silverman, his book Criminal Violence, Criminal Justice talks about this. California and Canada are about the same size population-wise. California had more homicides by knife than Canada had by all bullets. So if you take guns out of the equation, we're still a violent society. I had, I was on a cruise for my 40th, 45th anniversary, not 40th anniversary a few years ago, and at our table was a retired uh, London police officer. He was saying, I just don't get Americans and their love of guns and their opposition to health care. Okay, I, I, I get you. <laughs> uh, and to, to him, we look like a cowboy Wild West culture or something like that. Um, in one year, guns murdered 17 people in Finland, 35 in Australia, 200 in Canada, go down the list, 9,484 in the United States. Now the U.S. is bigger than any of those, but even if you do the adjustment for population size, we have a firearm death rate that's out of whack with all but third world countries. We have one close to some other third world countries, and that's the next list here top 20 countries for firearms death rate. And you see my previous home, Guatemala, is number three on the list. But it's mostly drug dealers killing other drug dealers. And so unless I'm out to buy drugs, it doesn't affect me at all. And as I said earlier, I don't worry about going into, you know, going to a concert or going to a movie theater and have some crazy person open fire uh, in those settings. The fact that our kids are buying bulletproof backpacks something wrong, I think, uh, and somehow it needs to be addressed, and that becomes the problem. We come in number 20th, and except for Greenland, I think Greenland's out there, number five, I'm not sure, I mean, there's only 13 total people that were killed in Greenland, I shouldn't say only 13, because that's 13 too many, but uh, other than that country, all of these are quote-unquote third world countries, or underdeveloped countries, so that's the company we're in when we look at homicide. Gun control laws, and this is what got me going on digging in a bit deeper. This is what I mean when I, I say, when it looks too simple, dig in a little bit. Mass shooting took place on November 7th, 2018 in Thousand Oaks, California. You probably don't remember it because we have mass shootings so often they all just become a blur after a while. But there were um, 13 killed, 16 injured, and I was on Facebook, and one of the groups I belong to, and Facebook, someone posted that gun control laws must not work since California has the strictest gun control laws. Now one, if you're a social scientist, you look at that and say, hmm, sample size equals one. Maybe we need a larger sample size for starters. But I wanted to check out his claim about California having the strictest gun control laws. There's a place called the Gifford Law Center that does actually track this stuff. Uh, California is a little ways down on this list on the left, and it shows California as number one, having the strictest gun control laws overall. Well, if you go beyond this one incident and look at their overall rate of gun-related deaths, that's the column, uh, the fourth column, they rank 44th out of the 50 states. 
so really low. So to take one incident and say, yep, can't be, time to go lost on work, because look. So I did what social scientists do. I took this data and did the regression analysis. I took all 50 states and see what it looks like when you look at the different states. And this is what it looks like. So it's basically showing the stricter the gun control laws, the lower the gun-related gun deaths is the term they use uh, overall. Now, that's in spite of pretty permeable borders. And what I mean by that is Chicago has pretty strict gun control laws with very high homicide rates. But it's, if anybody are from Indiana, I don't want to offend anybody from Indiana. So I won't call Gary a suburb of Chicago, but it's really close. <laughs> and Indiana does not have strict gun control laws. And no one's at the border saying, you know, did you buy a gun in Indiana that you're bringing into Chicago and all that stuff. That's what I mean by permeable borders. It's a state-by-state -state basis for the laws. And they don't dig in completely to which laws work most effectively and things like that. And I don't have the magic answer. But it's clear that gun control laws do make some of what of a difference. Now, when you get an R squared value of 56, that means 56% of the variance between the 50 states is explained by strictness of gun control law. What that also means is that 44% of the variance between the 50 states is explained by something else. It's something not in the equation. And you hear a lot of people say, well, it's not a gun issue, it's a mental health issue. And, you know, when someone climbs up into a hotel room and opens fire on a concert in Las Vegas and kills 57 people, mentally ill is a done deal in my <laughs> There's no question that person's got some mental issues. Uh, and you can pick the Pulse nightclub shootings or the school shootings or the theater in Aurora, Colorado, or the rest. And, yep. But, if, that's, if it's all about mental health, what's wrong with Americans becomes the next question. Why are we so mentally ill? Because I think it's also partly about our culture. Uh, one of the ways in which the U.S. is outstanding, and I mean an outlier, the World Values Survey looks at, they measure individualism versus collectivism, and we're number one when it comes to the most individualistic society on the face of the earth. Uh, that's, we can talk about rugged individualism, it's a good thing, but there are other kinds of individualism that come closer to selfishness or something like that. And so, and we have a culture that was born in violence, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, in his book, Criminal Violence, Criminal Justice, uh, he, said, he points out that the population of the U.S. doubled between 1820 and 1840, mostly by the immigration of aggressive malcontents. Uh, and so we may have aggressive malcontent bred into our culture in some ways, part of our culture in different ways. But it's something that I think needs to be addressed, however. And it's not going to be easy. People have been trying for years. Just one more point. The U.S. Uh, leads high income nations in gun violence. The U.S. accounts for 4% of the world's population, but 35% of global firearm suicides, and 9% of global firearm homicides. Both of those qualify as gun-related deaths. Questions or comments on any of that? Yeah. Um, so when the when you said that the gun violence, um, when there's like stricter laws on that in California, does that mean that the rate um, for other like knives or other violence rises? When That's a fair question. I don't know the answer to that. I suspect it can't. I mean, if the guy in the Las Vegas shooting had a knife, he's not going to kill 57 people. Uh, and so, and there are other, England had an incident a while ago where somebody went crazy with a knife and just started stabbing people. Right after I moved to Guatemala, we had an incident that kept us inside at night for a while. Two guys drove around in a pickup truck and the guy in the back of the truck jumped out stabbing seven different people just at random. But that's not at all contrary to Antigua, Guatemala. But we had just moved there and we're kind of, I think we'll eat at home in the evening and not go out to restaurants for a while. Nothing like that has happened since then. It was a really rare, isolated incident. So it doesn't solve all the violence, but particularly in terms of suicides, it often does make a difference. If a gun's available, so if somebody completing a suicide is much more likely than by other means uh, overall. So I, I don't have 
easy answers. I mean, people talk about universal background checks, waiting periods, and a wide variety of things that make sense to me. But one of the problems with the mass shootings is it's too late. The guns are out there. There is no preventing a mass shooting short of what criminologists call target hardening, which is why you may have security guards at your public schools now and other things like that. Someone who's a mass shooter, the guns are out there, so they're going to get access to guns. Uh, so different laws. I don't have the answer, but I think it's pretty clear it's a problem. Uh, and one that needs to be addressed. Um, I want to take a few minutes. Um, a while ago, I got into conversations about abortion. I know it's a hot button issue, uh, especially in evangelical circles. Uh, this is from uh, a study done by the World Health Organization. And basically, they've argued that countries that have outlawed abortion have similar rates to countries that have it. And so part of what they're saying is criminalization does not necessarily lead to reduced abortions overall. People find ways to get abortions. And I think I can ex explain a little bit why. I know we have a couple of criminal justice majors here, and you've probably come across deterrence theory. Christopher Powery and Jeremy Bentham and others developed this idea that it's the probability of apprehension, the probability of punishment, and severity of punishment. These are the three things we have to work with to keep people from committing crimes. The U.S. is focused mostly on severity of punishment. And I'll talk about why that could be a problem. One other piece is, is it the reality of these things or the subjective perception? And what I mean by that is, what do you think, if you were to shoplift, what do you think your odds are of getting caught? Two and five. Two and five? Actually, the clearance rate, the last time I looked, the FBI actually has clearance rates for crimes where larceny of 7%. 7% of people who commit larcenies are actually convicted of larceny. So, Subjectively, you might see it as a greater probability, a lower probability, but it's only deterrent if you're accurately assessing this the perception. Uh, that is, it's my subjective perception. I'll come back to that point in a minute. We've treated the, mock, the idea that it's an additive model. If we can make each of these more difficult, it will result, or any one of them more difficult, it will deter crime. I wrote a paper in grad school in which I argued that, it's, that that's the problem not additive, it's multiplicative. And that probably sounds like a foreign language at this point, but let me explain what I mean by that. If you take the additive model, you would say, well, the probability of apprehension plus the probability of punishment plus the severity of punishment equals deterrence, equals how much we're going to deter crime. So if we take the most severe, you're absolutely going to get caught, you absolutely will get punished, and we're going to execute you. And that's the most severe punishment. 10 plus 10 plus 10 equals 30. So you get a deterrence factor of 30. If you have a 50 50 chance of getting caught, uh, it's still 5 plus 10 plus 10 equals 25. So it's still a pretty strong deterrent. But if we think of it in a multiplicative terms, now we get a possible range of 0 to 1,000, 10 times 10 times 10. And with a low probability of apprehension, if you can imagine someone who's basically going to commit a really heinous crime and a severe penalty, but they're saying, I'm so smart, they'll never catch me. I can't get caught. The reason I argue that we should look at it as a multiplicative model, if we think, view it as additive, no probability of getting caught, but the other two, 10 plus 10 equals 20. But in a multiplicative model, 0 times 10 times 10, even though you're going to do math today, 0 times 10 times 10 equals 0. And again, it's not the reality, it's the subjective perception. So if I think I'm so smart, they'll never catch me, it doesn't matter how tough the penalties are. It doesn't matter if we have three strikes and they're all laws. Someone's still going to commit a crime. Does that make sense? Okay. And I think that was part of the problem with some of our war on drugs things. We just kept raising the penalties, but the certainty of apprehension is the weak point. Unless you have a cop on every corner, apprehending is the hard part. 
and, and therefore the most important part of the model. How does it apply to abortion? Clearance rates for homicides are pretty high. If there's a body laying around somewhere, it's pretty easy to, if somebody was killed, etc. In other cases, we may not even know a crime is committed. Uh, and so clearance rates for larceny and other types of crimes much, much lower overall. How would that apply to abortion? Let's say we recriminalize abortion, overturn Roe versus Wade. If you don't know, if we overturn Roe versus Wade, it doesn't eliminate abortion, it hands it back to the states. And before Roe versus Wade, some states had abortion, other states didn't. That's what would go back to. Now, theoretically, all 50 states could then enact bans on abortion, probably wouldn't have them but it could. Would there still be abortions? One of the problems is it's pretty difficult to detect, uh, especially with morning after pills and other things like that. And that's why that article from the World Health Organization saying, criminalized or not, it doesn't seem to make a difference in the overall abortion rates. When I was in the Czech Republic, I mentioned earlier that they have they're 14 weeks maternity leave, three years of paid parental leave. They enacted that in 1990. And 1990 is the high point of the graph in terms of abortion rates. Look what happened to the abortion rates after they passed this legislation that said 14 weeks paid maternity leave, three years of paid parental leave. You've got universal health care. Your child will have access to higher education abortion rates plummet. And so my debate on this is criminalizing abortion would make a statement, but it might not make a difference. And if what we really want is to make a difference, there may be other ways to get there. And so it's another case where I say it's just not as simple as we want to make it. Did they have, like, what was their teen pregnancy rate, and then how did that change? After? That's a good question, and I don't know. <laughs> they, they have free contraception. I mean, you can go to any pharmacy and get free contraception, and that would help with the teen pregnancy rate. We get nervous about that, encouraging promiscuity and all of that. Uh, teens have sex. Even teens in church use groups. I used to be a pastor, uh, and we don't like it, but it happens kind of thing. What other questions on any of this? That's pretty much what I've got. So, yeah. Um. I've heard a lot of research has been done in certain countries where abortion has been legalized and abortion rates have lowered. Is that true? I, do, I haven't come across that, but I'd be curious to see it. Yeah, yeah. And abortion is legal in the Czech Republic, but even though it's still legal, abortion rates just just plummet. And the way I think about it is, do you know the metaphor of carrot and stick? If you want to get a donkey to move, you can hit it with a stick or you can hold a carrot out in front of it. Well, criminalizing abortion is the stick. We're going to punish you if you do it. This is the carrot. This is saying if you choose to have the baby, we're there for you. You can keep your job. You, you can keep your job. You guarantee you get your job back. You've got three years with your child. And you can take two years at a higher rate of pay or four years at a lower rate of pay. So it's the same amount of dollars any way you do it, but they give you that kind of flexibility. Now, I don't see us going to this in my lifetime. Uh, and the same with universal health care. Could become a little closer, step by step. That's what I would hope, because in the end for me, the what I read when I read scripture, Genesis to Revelation, is a commitment to the common good. The widow, the alien, the orphan, the poor, runs through scripture. And sometimes that's done through individuals, sometimes through nonprofits, sometimes through the church, but also sometimes through government. And when I get into these arguments where people say, well, that's not the real government, that's the real church, and I say, we don't have to fight, there's plenty of poverty to go around. Uh, my point being, there's, there's a role for everybody to play in poverty reduction or in addressing some of these other things. And there is a role for government, as these other countries have illustrated and have a different definition. If I had a magic wand, food, clothing, shelter, education, and health care, public goods, and somehow we make sure everybody has enough to eat, everybody has a place to stay, the richest nation in the face of the earth. Remember 
Rich probably knows the verse. I don't remember the verse. I think in Deuteronomy, where they're getting the promised land, and it says something about a, a rich land, and there will be no poor among you. And there were poor. We know that from the prophets who yelled about it quite a bit. So it, it's not a prophecy in the sense of a prediction. It's a prescription. If you're living in a land with rich resources, there's no reason for there to be poor. And not just economically poor, but marginalized in terms of no access to food, shelter, etc. And so that's how I read what Bernard Dozier has a book called The Dream of God, how I would envision the dream of God, including that every child conceived is wanted and loved and cared for. I'm not sure criminalizing abortion moves as close to that, is my, my point on the abortion thing. Um, Paul, where did the, the data? From the abortion rates that, that, that you have here, where did where is that from? Um, it's it's from a source in the Czech Republic, but I don't remember where. I'll, I'll try to find it for you. Well, uh, no, it, it's okay. W one of the things I wonder about is, um, and then you'll find this funny. But back when I took a class with you, crime and delinquency. Remember yeah. When you used to teach that. Yep. I didn't even remember that I wrote this, but I. I he was I, the best student in the class. No, 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 I don't tell the others. No, 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 I don't. I don't know if that was the case or not, but like the. I, I wrote a paper uh -huh. on why we shouldn't decriminalize. Yes. So actually, so and and I still struggle with both sides of this argument yeah. sometimes. Uh -huh. So I wonder if like. In this case, if abortion becomes legalized. Is it, it and, and it's no longer considered a criminal act per se. Yeah. Is then are are they still collecting the data depending on the source in the same way that they would when it would be criminalized? Yeah. No, that's a fair question. And I, I wonder, like the, the who the the first article I pointed to, yeah. the World Health Organization, they talk about the methodology about, and it has more to do with hospital admissions and other things where they're estimating abortion rates. Uh, but it's it's a complicated methodology for sure. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah. And then the other thing I thought about with deterrence is like I I, I think probably deterrence on its own I would I would disagree with. I, I think deterrence works to a point. Yeah. Like I think that's why there are laws in place to deter people and to give them some sort of guidance in terms of how to behave and how not to behave. Yep. Yeah. But then I, I don't know that past a certain point deterrence continues to work because as you said, as you said, there are going to be people that do this regardless of whether or not yep. there's a and, there's some sort of yeah. And deterrence assumes a rational calculus. Assumes that somebody is sitting down. I always created a riot at Hillsborough College. I used to be <laughs> part time at Hillsborough College. And I was saying, uh, it depends on a rational calculus. So instead of deterrence in this area, how about corporate crime? How about three strikes and you're out for corporations? The government takes over all the assets, and that's when the riot started. <laughs> quite a protest from the students there. But if you think about it, you may not know, years ago, Ford was making a Pinto that exploded on impact. Uh, and Ford Motor Company's accountants sat down and did the math. It will cost $11 per car and $16 per truck fix the deficiency that allows these cars to explode, and it will cost $250,000 per loss of life suit if we don't fix it. And then they totaled the two columns, and guess what they did? Didn't fix it. Didn't fix it. Now, if we had deterrence crimes in that case, and the accountants are forced to say, well, wait a minute, do we really want to lose our the corporation and have the government take over? Because it's very clearly rational calculus when you get out your spreadsheet and are looking at probabilities and things like that. So I, the same applies, crimes of passion. Somebody in a fit of passion kills somebody else. I read one case, it was here in Jackson actually, two brothers were arguing over who got the last piece of fish. And one of the brothers stabbed his brother to death over, uh, I'm not sure any law yeah, right. <laughs> would stop that from happening. Uh, and so I agree, I think there is a place for deterrence but it's best applied when it's a crime that's got this kind of rational calculus somewhere along the line and doesn't make much of a difference in other cases. Other questions or comments? Maybe all 
and, and certainly the officer involved shootings. And even this, some people try to discredit the data on blacks in particular being killed by police by pointing to certain set of data. The best database is actually the Washington Post. But the Washington Post does shootings. So George Floyd doesn't count because he wasn't shot. Elijah McClain doesn't count. Eric Garner doesn't count. There's another database called Mapping Police Violence. When you look at that database, the difference by race is a big difference. So we've got a ways to go with that. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Morgan Freeman supporter is saying that the solution to the race problem is to just stop talking about it. My response is, if he gets pulled over by the police, he gets to be Morgan Freeman. That is, he's going to be Morgan Freeman first and the black person second. And not every black person gets that benefit of celebrity and so forth. And so it's easy for him to say, just stop talking about it. But I think we need better conversations around it. And through that, it's still a problem. Anything else? Yeah. Just one more last comment, maybe. In our class, we've been learning a lot about certain generational characteristics. And like the baby boomers, obviously, the number one is loyalty. You guys have extreme loyalty to this country because you've seen everything. You've been through a lot, right? Yeah. And you've seen how far we have gone. Whereas my generation, you know, Barack Obama being president wasn't a big deal to us. Right. It was just another president. Yes. And the George Floyd movement, like, those were very recent to us. Like, we lived through a very long school during it. And the mass school shooting was, like, extremely common to us as well. Yeah. Every single person in this room has probably, you know, known someone that's experienced or gone through something like that. So how do you, how do you look at this country where, right now at the moment, many of the people in Congress are baby boomers. Yeah. The generation after. And now you guys are in this generation where we don't have any more. So we don't have more of it. Why do we yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. How do you, how would you, I don't know, what would you say to someone who would want to verify certain things or something, but they shouldn't have motivated to do something? Because it's, it's not just the age thing, it's also, uh, I think there's maybe one senator who's not a millionaire. And so, they don't go to my life. It's not connected with that for the most part. And we were close to them there uh, for things like that. And so I think in many cases they're oblivious to the status of the average mirror. And so if you get an answer to that, let me know, because I would like to have the answer myself. I mean, someone told me because I was to harass my legislators on a regular basis to try to get them to 
do what's right. Thanks for your patience and time. I appreciate it.